Good morning. Welcome to the New Beginning Celebration. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. And of course I will be glad. Why? Because I pastor, I have to teach the word. Again, welcome to New Beginning Celebration. Those of you who are coming by way of YouTube or Facebook or any other media source, thank you for joining in with us. Your time is precious to you and it's precious to us. And we pray that God will use this time to bless you and it won't be wasted, but will be well worth the, the opportunity to tune in with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We're starting a new series today. Not going to be very long, but this new series is kind of connected to the last series. We had the last series, Living by the Principle of C. Well, today, with pretty easy transition, we're going to transition into kingdom giving. Principles and benefits. Kingdom giving. Principles and benefits. But we have to understand the practice. This is part one, the introduction, and we'll do all we can to get through the introduction so next week we can really dig. We're going to dig hard, but today we're going to lay, lay the foundation of what it is that we need to discuss concerning kingdom giving. I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I know there are because I hear them, and I, you know, walking around people in general, um, they say things about giving offerings and giving to the church. We're going to discuss some of those things. We're going to find out why. We're going to find out, first of all, what God said, why he said it, and the results of doing what he said. We're going to explore some of those myths and misconceptions because people really don't understand. Let's go ahead and dig in. The words give or tithe or offering or seed planting or plant a seed has almost become a cuss word when it comes to giving to the Lord. Most people call it giving to the church. Don't understand it. When you give to anything or anyone, when you give, especially your tithes and offering, you're giving to the Lord. You're not giving to the church. You're giving it into the church, which is the bank house for God. When it's offering time, or a ministry solicits financial support over the airwaves, most people tend to cramp up, get a little tight, their palms get sweaty, and in various terms wonder, why preachers always keep asking for money? Y'all like my English right there? <laughs> Why preachers keep always asking for money? It seems that there is not much, there is not as much of an issue when it's time to pay the restaurant for that delicious meal you just devoured. And sometimes it ain't so delicious and you pay it anyway. Fries cold, burger hard, overcooked, drinks watered down. You slurp it down, slop it up, wipe your face, and pay that bill. Well, I tell you, I'd hate for you to come in my restaurant, no matter how good or bad the food is, and you complain every time you come in. Be like, excuse me, there's a, you cannot trespass sign on this door anymore for you specifically. <laughs> I know my food is terrible, but since you know my food is terrible, stop coming in my restaurant. When it's time to pay Hollywood actors through your giving of funds to purchase movie tickets, cable and satellite bills, you're A-OK. -okay. Like clockwork, every month that bill comes through because you've been entertained by John Travolta, Tom Cruise, and whatever the rest of their names are. Denzel, Denzel Washington, there we go. And you pay that bill because you watch that good old movie, Man on Fire, Face Off. You know, Nicolas Cage in there too. Top Gun. I know I'm going way back. Back to the future. You still paying for that? I got <laughs> something wrong with you. But we we a okay. Yeah. Nobody asked him. Oh, you know the satellite bill is due. 
The example will even roll right along with paying athletes to play a game or, or, or live or via television, in person or via television. These guys get paid money. Basketball players, football players. I mean, ridiculous, a ridiculous over amount of money to play a game. I used to go out in the yard with boys until I was 16, 17 years old. No pads. Now, I was a baseball player primarily, but in the, in the hood, we like to play football in the big field up the street. Yeah, I said street. And right wide open, 4 3 40. And there was a couple of dudes out there playing with us. I know it was 4 1 and 4 2. That was two or three guys in my neighborhood faster than me. And just hit each other as hard as Mack trucks. They had to almost put smelling salts under my nose one day when two of them collided when I caught a football. I most of the time quarterbacking. I flick the ball back, somebody else gonna hit me in the pass. I, I, we did the old flea flicker, the old trick plays. And I go out, and I'm going towards the ditch in the road. There was these big old concrete pipes that they hadn't put up on the, it looked like they were planning on putting a the driveway there. And when them two brothers hit me, first of all, I blacked out while I was in the air. And when I came to, I was straddled my back across one of them pipes. They helped me up. I shook it off after I saw the stars. After I woke up, you all right, man? Yeah. All right, back on the center. Let's go. Good hit. But I held on to the ball. We pay ridiculous. But when I was playing baseball and basketball, all I was doing was keeping in shape. Getting paid a large amount of money to basically be at the health spa. Best workout facilities. <clears throat> I mean, we're just... <clears throat> Here you go, Steph Curry. $400 million, but so here you go, so-and-so, $350 million, here you go, so, and they run up and down the court for two hours in the best shape of their life, and we're paying them to keep in shape, but if you want to keep in shape, you're going to have to go buy a membership. We don't, we don't fret about that. <laughs> and I'm not condemning or opposed to those things, but when it comes to giving to the one who created all things, and gave us all things to enjoy, including the people, the food, the abilities, the sports, and even the money, we have reservations and ask foolish and stupid questions. Like, why do they ask for my money? And created a thing. Why do I need to give to the church? I'm talking about Christians now. I ain't mean, talking about the world. We know, we know what the world going to think. I'm talking this happens in the body of Christ or those who think they're part of the body of Christ who may never really have come in. They're just church goers. You know, they sit in church and think they're a Christian. Like if they walk in the car, in the garage, they think they're a car. You ain't no more Christian coming in this building than you are a car walking in your garage. You've got to be transformed by receiving the, the, the fact that Jesus rose again, died and rose again from the dead, shed his blood for your life, and is sitting on high at the right hand of God. You got to believe and confess it with your mouth. Why do I need to give to the church? Then it's become obvious that there is a lack of knowing and understanding God, the Bible, and the practice and promises associated with giving. We're talking about, we, we just come off living by the principle of seed, so this is just perfect. And I like to teach only one time a year, strictly on giving. Only once a year, you ain't gonna hear me up here begging and pleading. Brother, beg, sweet darling, please don't leave me, girl. You ain't gonna hear me up here begging and pleading. I ain't too proud to beg. But I'm not gonna beg and plead for your money. I will beg and plead for your sympathy. But I'm not gonna beg and plead for your money. Thank you, Temptation. That came out of the book of Temptation. <laughs> It's going to be a pretty hard message. It's going to be a sobering message. So when we get to the end, we'll realize how foolish we are and how much more impactful our lives could have been for what God wants to do for us. You want to keep driving that car? You pay that car note, don't you? You might grumble and complain just a little bit. 
And sometimes you don't grumble and complain. You just know, okay, hey, this is what I got to do. I got to pay my bills. And they didn't give you the money to pay for it with. Isn't that funny? You don't want to, we have a hard time giving the ministry to the one, God himself, the Lord, who gave you the finances. He gave you the power to get wealth. So even the gifts and skills and talents of the hands that you have to do what you do to receive funds, he gave that to us. That man over there that built your house ain't gave you nothing. <laughs> gave you a slip of paper to sign, put your name on the dotted line, here are your keys. You, he didn't give you them keys, you paid for them. Gave you every blade of grass in that yard was in the cost of that house. Let your mailbox get rusty and break down. Did the man who built a house come back and put you up a new mailbox? Well, that one that got wore out. Because his mailbox was falling down in the yard. That mailbox was gone. No offer, rusted, beat up. Had to go buy a new mailbox. I didn't hear her tell us that the builder came by and dropped her off. Hey, we see your mailbox is falling apart. Here you go, hon. <laughs> Woo! So we're going to understand some things today. Today, let's see if we can undo and destroy wrong thinking about giving and bring some correction and righteousness concerning the blessing of giving. It is blessed to give. The Bible says in the book of Acts, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That, that, that'll, that'll come home in this message. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Because you're going to find out, like the old song said. Let's begin. Let's begin this teaching by turning in the Bible. Go to the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38. We're going to get us a foundational text here. And we're going to make sure that God deals with our hearts and our minds. Our minds do need to be renewed. We just talked about that prior to going on the air. The renewing of our minds. Let's change the way we think. We can't live a transformed life, or that word translates to transfigured life. If y'all remember the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, and then Moses and Elijah showed up. Well, that same word, transform, in Romans 12, and being changed as by the Spirit of the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, those two words are the same word as transfigured. So if you want to live like Christ, you got to get your mind transfigured. So you will look and behave transfigured. Luke 6 and 38, the Bible reads, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Father, we thank you for this message today. And first of all, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We, we can't, we would not be here to do any of this. If it had not been for your, your mercy and the grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. We thank you for him coming, redeeming us, sacrificing it all and bringing us into your family. We thank you, Father, that he, your living word, gave us the written word, that the Logos gave us the rhema, that we can continue on knowing more of who you are so that we can know you better and love you more. Thank you for loving us because without you loving us first, we could not love you, for we only love you because you first loved us. Thank you that you are perfect love. You're not a deadbeat dad, but a faithful father. So, Father, we ask you now, Abba, Daddy, that you will give us something now that is beyond the treasures of the earth, and that's the impactful transformation of your word to change our very lives. Fill us, God, with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and all spiritual understanding that we may walk worthy of the Lord and fully pleasing unto the Lord. And that we will fail less and less and be more like Christ. That we will look more 
like the one to whom you have given our lives to. We thank you for drawing us, for pulling us out of the trash heap, cleaning us up, and continuing to clean us up, that we may be called the sons of God. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us. Thank you for winning all of the victories for us, fighting for us, and being merciful to us. We love you. We thank you. Amen. When we get through with this series, you won't have to hear it again until this time next year. I'm excited to bring this teaching not only immediately following living by the principle of seed, but also entering earthly and Jewish harvest season. We're, we're in September now. It's harvest time. The time of year when much of what has been planted can be reaped and enjoyed. I only teach giving as a separate teaching, like I said, once a year. I put this in my notes here, all right, just so y'all know. I do not beg or ask for you to give. I just simply teach God's word and let you know if you want to give to God through this ministry, how you may be able to do so. I simply teach the word and let God's word and the power of his word pull you. Now, once it's done, if you don't change your mind on how to get, that means you blocked off what you wanted to hear. You blocked off what you needed to hear. You didn't hear what you wanted to hear. And that's direct disobedience to God. And it's not going to do anything to me. Okay? All right, buckle up. This verse is loaded. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, spoke this into the ears of his disciples as he prepares them to become filled with him, to be just like him, and do the works of God in the earth. First, we are commanded to give. It just simply says, give. Secondly, when we give, there is a promise, a guarantee straight from the mouth of the word himself, the word of God, that it shall be given to us. He didn't say may be given, possibly given. Well, well, think about it. He said that give and it shall be. Not just even will be, shall. Shell kind of kind of locks it in. It shall be given unto you. I often hear it asked from Christians. Why do I have to do it first? Why do I have to make the first move? Why do I have to forgive someone first? Why do I need to give first? Honey, let me set the record straight. <laughs> Don't be so full of yourself. Don't be so full of yourself. Why do you have to do it first? Yeah, let's set, let's set this right. God gave to you before you were even born. God forgave you before you were even a thought on your parents' minds. So stand to be corrected. You are not the beginning or the end of doing anything. Let's clear the, clear the air right now. Get that out your raggedy minds. Therefore, when God commands for us to do something, he himself has already done it to a greater measure than we ever could. I don't care, write a letter. I'd love to hear from him. Because if, if you think that much about yourself, then now we got a problem with pride. You need to go back on the videos a few, a few pages back. You know, true humility. The first one starts with getting rid of pride. And just for good measure, you know we want God to give, 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 give to us without having any skin in the game, doing nothing. Hmm. In the hood, we used to call them kind of folks leeches. Old leech. Every time I turn around, they're coming down the road for an old spoonful of salt, cup of sugar. They ain't never get it back. Can I borrow? I mean, that's the most overused word. In, well, there's two overused words in, in the world. Love and borrow. Can I borrow? I ain't never seen none of it come back. We just call them folks leeches. So let me offer this challenge. Next week, I want you to go to work and sit on your derriere and do nothing. And let's see how much and or what you do receive. I bet it won't be a paycheck. <laughs> and you shouldn't expect one because when you became a part of that company, you agreed to their terms of employment, which meant you were to what? Give of your talents, 
give of your skills, give of your abilities, and you shall receive for your giving. It might trickle a little change in your pocket when you get, get downright sitting on your derriere and just showing them you're not going to do anything, but you're going to get something. They're going to give you one thing for sure. It's pink. It's pink. We call them also walking papers. You will be in the unemployment line. Just try it. Just try it. Give, 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 give. That's all we want God to do, but when it's time to give to him, uh, 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 well, you know, I, I can barely keep my bills paid. Let me help y'all understand something. Now, and we're going I'm, I'm to try not to go too far ahead, but when I became a giver, a consistent giver, living paycheck to paycheck, I want to describe to you what I'm doing today. I want to describe to you what I've done twice within a year at the car dealership I work for. I didn't say I think I would like to have. Go get the key. I'll sign the papers after work. Twice. Has nothing to do with me. Has everything to do with God. And the principles he gave us to live by. Because I fail all the time. I'm still a number six. Though I have number seven dwelling in me. I'm still a number six. But he and his righteousness and in his word gave us principles to live by. That good sense to try to do some management. Thank God for a wife that knows how to manage some finances with me because I am too, I'm too busy with other stuff and she does a great job. I used to do it at one point, but I found out that this girl keep up with numbers like crazy. Here, you, you handle this. For all you men out there that's too prideful to think, okay, you can allow your wife to do those things. Hey, back up. God gave talents and gifts to everybody. She's your help me. Don't overload yourself trying to be the hero. We get so much hero preaching in this world. I, I, I just can't stand it. And I believed that crap for so long in my life that I was carrying burdens and weight and, and, and things on my shoulders that I didn't have to because I just didn't want to pour it over to my helper. That was a free nugget. That ain't got nothing, anything to do with this message. That was free. Don't y'all don't have to give an offering for that. God has a simple or similar principle that our employers do. He has a similar principle, which he started, by the way. He first gave you natural life, and he received a companion. One for God, zero for you. Wait a minute. The scoreboard is out there in left field, some big green monster they call it up there in uh, that ugly town in Massachusetts. We're already in the hole. We're already in the hole. One for God, zero for you. Down with nothing at birth. Let's keep going. God gave his son to you, even before the foundations of the world, at no cost to you. Uh-oh, to zip. Well, we're going to get some good pitching in this game. And he received another son, you. All right? When Jesus gave us to the father, the father in turn multiplied us into many sons. And the tally goes on and on and on. Over there, the big green monster, they ain't got enough rows to keep up with the score. God is so much more of a giver than us. We can never, never catch up. Uh-oh. God gave us a doctor that will help us come into the world. Uh-oh. God gave us parents. We still ain't gave nothing yet. Uh-oh, God gave us breath. Uh-oh, we still ain't gave anything yet. God gave us food to eat as soon as we hit the, hit the, hit the atmosphere. Oh, we still ain't gave anything yet. Y'all know how far in the hole we were in the first 10 minutes of life. But we are complaining about giving to him. We'll pull back on giving to him. You know, we don't miss that ball game. We don't miss, we don't miss the, 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 the cable bill. 
We don't miss that gas pump. We don't miss lunch or dinner. Well, no, you work like I do. Sometimes you might skip it and don't even realize you missed it. But he has multiplied and multiplied the givings unto us. So, we can now finish this teaching since we have attacked pride, rebellion, disobedience, crushing all naysayers and foolishness. Moving forward. The next part of our text tells us how it would be given to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Those of you who belong to this church <clears throat> or come to fellowship here at this church know exactly what I'm going to tell you. But for the sake of our viewing audience, our congregation that's a little bit out there from us, when in that time they went to market, they would bring their bushel basket. And they would come to market to buy grain. Grain was the number one thing to buy there. Grain would almost transfer to anything. Bread. A couple other things. They would take it and make beer. I mean, grain is an amazing thing. It's almost like bare aspirin. It just solves a whole lot of problems. But they would take the bushel basket to market. And the person at the market would fill the basket. Good measure. A good measure. Then they would press it down by hand or by a device that they would press it down with. Then they would pick your bushel basket up and they would just shake it together so that the pieces come together more like, like pieces of a puzzle that they would just fit. We're getting rid of all the air pockets, all the excess space. I mean, you are getting fair a fair amount for the value or the amount of money that you pay. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and then they would go ahead and pour more onto it till it was running down on the outside of the basket. And God will give to us, or it will be given to us, good measure, press down, shake it together, running over, will it be given unto our bosom. Hmm. Have you ever heard the saying or the song, you can't beat God's giving no matter how you try? You can't beat God's giving no matter how you try. The great benefit of giving is that God makes certain that the quality of what's given to you is full, complete, and abundant. Enough for you and others who you see that are in need. Hmm. Take a look at me. Take a look at. Uh, take a look with me at Proverbs. Where are we going? Proverbs three nine through ten. Please turn there with me, please. Proverbs three verses nine and ten. Some of you have the Bible apps on your phones or your iPads and iPods and eyeballs and all that other, those other eyes. Just tap and click and punch and scroll and slide. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your, of how much? All your increase. Honor the Lord with how much? Your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Bonus check. Take it off the top. So your, listen, just like the verse we just read. So your barns will be filled with plenty. That refers to grain. Most of the time the barns were filled with grain. Another thing, but the first, the first thought here, process in this verse is about grain because it was so multifaceted in what you can do with it. So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. 
for all you folks out there that are Christians and so sanctimonious you don't believe that we should drink wine. <laughs> and don't tell me because it's a proverb, it's just, that's a pictorial, that's it. No, no, no. Read your Bible in its entirety. When God wanted to say vinegar and grape juice, he sure said it over there in the book of Numbers. He said, vinegar, grape juice, and wine. I don't think the God of all creation has a problem choosing which words he want to use. All right, here we go. Got a glass of wine waiting for me when I get home. I just have to pour it in. This first roots is exactly what it says. Take God's portion right off the top first. This is also known in another term called, another term we call the tithe which means 10. We're going to get into that later. This has been God's from the beginning. This has been his formula from the beginning. We see it with Cain and Abel, all the way up to Solomon. Solomon's writing this, this proverb. Or excuse me, David is writing this, 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 this song. And Solomon writes it also in the Proverbs. So at least all the way up to Solomon, we can just see in the Old Testament, Cain and Abel. We see that as we give to the Lord, it is given to us full, complete, abundant, and overflowing. Giving to God and giving to him first carries a result of prosperous provision for the giver. It is not a burdensome thing. Giving to God and giving to him first. We will properly exegete this verse later in this series. This verse will come back. I don't. I just want to get the foundations laid down of giving, kingdom giving, giving in the kingdom of God. Now, when we say giving unto the Lord, does it only mean to give money in the offering in a church? Hmm. Let's find out. I believe we'll find some handles of help in Matthew 25, 31 through 40. Matthew tw chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. I hope I do okay with being able to repeat. I know when a lot of times you're following somebody teaching and they just kind of give the scripture verse one time. You kind of, you know, you, you hope you can find it online or something. Run it back and get that scripture reference. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40. Does giving to the Lord only mean giving money? Ready? And here we read. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another. And he's talking about the goats and the sheep, right? Because this is from one another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now I had to read all of that so you'll understand what I'm getting ready to say to connect with the Ministry. I see someone looking at me like, why is he reading this? The king will say to those on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you gave me a roof. Took me in. I was naked, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you gave me a visit. You visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You gave your time and took that opportunity. Listen to what he said. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? 
And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. Motor is blowed up and turned four. I see it now. Somebody get out the speedy drive and the roll back because that car is not coming out of turn four. There is oil all over the track. Somebody's motor just got blowed up. Jesus said that when we give to others, especially those of the household of faith, my brethren, remember what we talked about, brethren, referring to family, kingdom of God, do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Let all good things begin again at the household of faith. He said, when you did it to one of the, even the least of these, my brethren, you did it to who? So when we gave clothes to that person that needed clothes, when we gave food to that hungry person, when we took time out to go visit another individual in prison or in the hospital or in the sick bed at home, guess who we were given to? See, because we got to always go back to the, what is it? The law of first mention. And what's the law of first mention that we can refer to right here? In the image of man, God created him. He said, let us create man in our image and according to our likeness. When the, when the death penalty came about, when government law was being established on the earth for man to handle government, the first thing God instituted was the law of the death penalty. If man shed man's blood, his blood shall be shed by man. For in the image of God, he created him. Why? Because life is in the blood. But God always throughout the scriptures referred back to man's importance of being and existing connected strongly to who he is. Tell you what, you don't believe that? Let somebody mess with my son. I'm going to show you how strongly connected he was in Texas. We ain't talked in a long time. But let me hear tell of somebody mess with my son before the police can get to him. Honey, he has seen a bad day. I'll tell my son, I don't live most of my life. I got him. If they lock me up for the rest of my life, I'm good. Been there, done that. I know what the bed feels like and how the, how the food tastes. Let somebody mess with my child. You want to see how strongly connected he is to me? That's how strongly connected we are to God. Even more so. Hmm. Everybody get this? Everybody get this? So when we feed that hungry person, when we give drink to that thirsty person, when we take in that person, even a stranger, when we give that naked person clothing, when we visit that sick person and help care for them and that person in prison, because that's still giving and even visiting because you're giving your time. You're giving your resources. They, nobody else is paying for your gasoline to go there. Your food and lunch, depending on how far they are, if it's a two or three hour drive, you're going to have to eat somewhere between going there, an hour and a half to two hour visit, and then driving back. I mean, we, we just talking about seven hours of your day just got chunked out. That's given to the Lord. I believe that kingdom given is not God commanded to deplete us. Okay? I don't believe God commanded kingdom given to deplete us of what we have and leave us destitute. But as we can see so far in this introduction, it is a principle in which he has the wonderful privilege of, of a loving, faithful father to bless his children. It's an investment. We'll invest in our 401k. We invest in our stock market. We invest in our homes, the upkeep of our homes, the upkeep of our vehicles. Those are, uh, that, those are investments. Well, God is letting you know, wait a minute, the best investment you can make is giving into my kingdom. Where moth and fire and rust cannot destroy. It can't be corroded. <clears throat> <coughs> Whenever God asks us to give in the scriptures, it is also always associated with a promise tied to it in regards to us receiving something in return for our good. Now, in the scripture verse we just read, 
<clears throat> or that passage we just read. It didn't tell us what those people received on earth. But one thing they did receive was the privilege of sitting at his right hand in glory. <clears throat> it also talks about those who saw him in those conditions and didn't get. Or saw others in those conditions and didn't get. This is what they got. <clears throat> this is what you're going to get if you go, go to work next week and sit on your laurels and don't do anything. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. <clears throat> now we got, we've saved by grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, him sacrificing his life and the work he did for us. But there's a beautiful thing about rewards that God gives to us, even in eternity, and how we give and live here on earth. You don't believe that? We go to the book of Corinthians. It talks about the works that are of straw, hay, and stubble that get burned up. And then the works that are of stone and, and, and precious metals and that's what will last. Well, he's trying to give a description there. <coughs> of this. Even in the life of a believer, we're going to lose some things. <coughs> that stuff that wasn't done right in, in the kingdom of God, what wasn't done from the heart, what was done grumbling and griping and complaining and murmuring, <coughs> doing the things we didn't want to do, we just did it grudgingly. And the things that will last are the things we did for righteousness sake with the right perspective, the right heart attitude as a cheerful giver. The things we did to try to make ourselves all puffed up and put out there, destroyed, burned up. But the things we did in the, in the place of humility because of Christ and because God has asked us to do these things. He's commanded and he's asked. And he implores us. He He delightfully woos us to do things. And we'll do it. We'll do it. Whenever God asks us to give in the scripture, it's always associated with something of a promise of how God will do things in return for our good. We're going to end here for now, but we will continue this series next week. And we're going to continue this series next week to bring to us to a place of joyful, cheerful, hilarious giving with a willing heart. We've got to learn how important it is to give into the kingdom of God. God, give, 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 give. And we don't want to give back. That's a bad thing. And let me tell you something. When you stop giving like you should, you're going to notice it. Things get a little tight. I understand. I understand. When things get a little tight, that, 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 there's that tendency... And that propensity to, well, you know, I'm just, I'm going to borrow this out of here from God right now and I'll pay him back in a month. Careful, because you might forget. You do it again, and all of a sudden, the devil gets you comfortable. <coughs> After a while, you're back to just giving pennies. You don't even give as much of a tithe. We got to be careful. <coughs> Because when we give, you want to know some God's still giving to us. He is. I see a lot of trees out that window over there, as I can see just a, just a little section. There's a lot of trees out there. You know what those trees are doing? You know what the rest of those plants are doing out there for us human beings? What is it giving us? Oxygen. Who created those trees and plants? God. What did he say that his word will never stop? His word is never ending. And he spoke that stuff into existence and it keeps doing exactly what he commanded to do. One time. <clears throat> All he had to do was say it one time and the word kept going. He's still giving to us. Let's not complain, gripe, and grumble. Church members, Christians, body of believers, body of Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, disciples, Whatever else you, we call ourselves, followers of the way. Let's make certain that we attend to giving to the Lord without hiccup, hesitancy, or delay. I think he's given enough that we should never complain. 
Y'all are amazing. I hope you join us next week if you're joining us on YouTube. This is, again, a wonderful time to be alive. We are blessed to be here. We are blessed to even be in this time where we see things being shook up. God is allowing <clears throat> some things to happen in our world that it's hard to explain. It's hard to understand. Some people that just don't get it. But what we do need to get is the word of God implanted in us. Hey, we are New Beginning Celebration. We are here at 3400 Trent Road, New Bern, North Carolina. We're, at, we're in Suite D at 3400 Trent Road, New Bern, North Carolina. New Beginning Celebration. Our email address, you see it there, newbeginningcelebration at yahoo.com. The phone number 252-631-2188. And the website, nbcelebration.com. NB Celebration at Yahoo is the email. NBCelebration.com is the website. Go on our website. Check out some things. There's not much there to, to, to try to be elaborate with, but just read about who we are. We believe in the Word of God. It is infallible, and it's the only thing in this world that can change our lives and set us on the course of success and help us to prosper in all things, in our spirit, our soul, in our mind, and even in our bodies, in, our, in, in things that we have to enjoy. You all are amazing. Thank you for taking your time out with us. I hope it was well spent. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.